A furnace blast of heat hit me in the face as I stepped off the military plane into Kuwait, our first stop on the way to Iraq. We had just spent 26 hours traveling from the US and everyone was disoriented and groggy. We were standing in yet another long line and I had no idea what it was for. What's your proof of life, word or phrase? What? I asked. The sergeant stared at me for a minute. Ma'am, it's in case you get taken POW. We need to know if you're alive or dead. So you need to tell me a word or a phrase that you or your family would know and the enemy couldn't fake. Right. Uh, okay, um, my childhood nickname was Zizi. I felt sick and stupid. Thanks, he replied without looking up again. I was still stunned that I was deploying. I had just finished a postgraduate physical therapy program and I felt my best use was to teach other army physical therapists all the skills I had just learned. Instead, I was going to a one-man PT clinic on a small forward operating base in Iraq. Who the fuck had I pissed off? <laughs> it was 3.30 in the morning when we got to Baghdad International Airport. We were a mob of soldiers that moved like a massive cattle drive through each building. We sat down and a lieutenant colonel came in. I don't know who he was, but I'll never forget what he said to us. Soldiers, most people in this world wonder if they'll impact other people, if their lives will have any meaning when they're gone. None of you will have to wonder about that again. God bless you and good luck. I fought back tears and swallowed hard and for the first time, a little bit of pride began replacing fear. From the time I joined the Army to become a physical therapist, I had been fascinated by the grit and endurance of my soldier patients. They, they seemed so young. Many had only a high school diploma. I felt protective over them, even maternal. We came from different worlds. I wondered where they were from, why they had joined the Army, what they even did every day for work. We were in the same army, but we were so different. The sons and daughters of America struggling to get ahead in the machine of the military. I admired them. And I had a particular soft spot for the junior soldiers. For them, I would fight. Standing up to the commander who was running them too many days a week, causing injuries, or the postpartum soldier who just needed an extra month to get ready for the physical training test, I was a samurai warrior for these young heroes. My degrees and my officer rank were my ammunition. My work was in a temperature controlled clinic, waiting for them to come to me with their twisted ankles and aching backs. I worked hard to get them healthy, but I also knew I had it good. I had never even been outside my clinic on a training exercise with the real army. Until five years ago, it was unheard of for a physical therapist to deploy. Now, every infantry commander in the army was screaming to get one of us in their units. This common sense change in big army petrified me. Over the next few days, I moved on or off buses, planes, and military vehicles at least five times, each time tracking down and moving four 50-pound duffels filled with army-issued gear. <laughs> the amount of energy and effort it takes to get from one place to another with all that gear and 100 plus degree heat, it is simply degrading to the ego. I wanted to cry, scream, and laugh as I tried to drag those bags and myself over massive fields of loose rock. By the time I stood in line for my flight to Fob Falcon, my uniform was soaked through, I stunk, my hair was stuck to my face, and my helmet was falling off to one side. I, I felt like I was watching somebody else's body, like 
I was a cog in a wheel that was part of a machine that I simply didn't understand. This is not my world. I have officer rank, and yet I'm very clearly not in charge here. While I am a soldier, I feel like the frailest and the least trained soldier in this combat zone. I wasn't trained to be a killer. I was trained to be a healer, and yet here I am. I was yanked out of my thoughts by the voice of a sergeant screaming, Flight to forward operating base Falcon. Get moving now. The bird is on the ground. Let's go. I grabbed my gear, practically running to keep up with him and the others, and I thought, God, I hope you know what you're doing. Six of us were rushed out to a waiting helicopter that had its rotors spinning furiously. It was 0130 in the morning. The flight crew quickly stacked her gear inside and checked her seatbelts. I noticed that there were no doors on the helicopter, and I double and triple checked my seatbelt again. Next, two of the crew swung into positions at the open window. They, they swung their machine guns down into the ready position. They put on their night vision goggles and began scanning the darkened countryside. As I, t I had been in helicopters before, but none of them had machine guns on board, and all of them had doors and windows that closed. We flew, nape of the earth, low, to avoid the enemy weapons to get a fix on us. All of my senses were on full alert. Everything around me was in sharp relief. The brightly lit fl flight panels, the gunners' tense faces, the soldiers' edgy reactions next to me, the hot Iraqi air rushing through the cabins, the dim lights of the city and the homes below, and the constant whoop, 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 whoop of the rotors. It was 0230 when we landed. The pilots kept the engines on. They seemed in a hurry to get out of there. The crew chief pointed at me and yelled, get out. Well, I think that's what he said, because I really couldn't hear what he said over the, the noise of the rotors. But I had a pretty good idea what his pantomime meant. As I scrambled out of the helicopter, the rotor wash whipped around my face. I, I'm sure it was the whirling dirt that, in the air that caused the tears that I could feel burning in my eyes. I blinked them away as I watched the crew chief heave my bags onto the ground. He pointed at my gear as if to tell me, get the hell over there and away from his helicopter. In what seemed an instant, he was back on board, the gunner's window framing him. The helicopter lifted off, and I stood alone in the, on the rocks in the blackest of nights. The sound of the chopper became more and more distant, and then it disappeared completely. Silence descended. I stood there, alone waiting. Surely someone would come. Wouldn't they? There were no obvious visual references to tell me which way to start walking. A few dimly lit buildings glowed in the distance, but they looked quiet. Everything was the same dull brown color. I looked for soldiers, maybe moving on or off the flight line, but again, it just looked deserted. My stomach was clenched with fear. And then I got pissed. What the fuck? <laughs> didn't they know I was coming? Like, didn't they designate someone to come and get me? Where's the commander or the first sergeant? This is so fucked up. I realized at that point, if I didn't get me and my 200 pounds of gear off that helipad immediately, another flight might just come and land on me. <laughs> Welcome to Iraq. Ultimately, I, found, I did find the command building, and my first sergeant led me to my room, where I slept for six hours. When I woke up, I left my trailer feeling disoriented, not knowing if I should wear my body armor or bring my gas mask. I mean, heavens, not, let's not be over or underdressed for the party, I thought to myself. Yeah, you're really a sick woman, I thought to myself next. But honestly, I didn't want to look like the stupid newbie walking in to work for the first day. I decided to wear my body armor and leave the gas mask at home because 
They never fit right anyways. I headed to the Troop Medical Clinic, where I would work for the next year. Sandbags were stacked high, covering every inch of the windows. Massive artillery rounds were firing from base, and I could hear small arms fire going off in the distant city. The surreal sounds that made me jump didn't seem to make any impression on the line of soldiers waiting for me at the clinic. Most of them are sweaty and dirty, and all of them look tired. I made my little 15 by 15 plywood clinic into a haven as much as possible that year. I wrapped white Christmas lights around the ceiling and played John Mayer's third album, Continuum, on a loop. <laughs> I tried to create a place where my soldiers could put their memories away for just a little while. I wanted them to remember that there's still kindness and healing in this place. On the other hand, I was still trying to adapt to their world, to stop jumping when I heard gunfire while I was brushing my teeth, or seeing soldiers in the laundry line with filthy uniforms but clean, well cared for weapons. Some things I just never got used to seeing, like Humvees with gunshot cracked windows, or enemy POWs in blindfolds with hands tied behind their backs while I walked to work. Some people just never ad adjust to life here. Rumors floated around the clinic about the mental health officer who was sent home for failure to adapt, and a colonel on another fob who shot himself in the head in his room a month before he was supposed to go home. My life became about getting soldiers better so that they could go back out into the sector and risk their lives again. It was about reading x-rays, putting on casts, and making decisions on which injuries were serious enough to be evacuated back to the green zone, or home, or not. The docs looked to me to make the call on any musculoskeletal injury that might take a soldier out of the fight. I was the only physical therapist on a fob of 8,000 soldiers. Patch them up and keep them fighting. Believe it or not, it's almost always what they wanted too. Like Specialist Brown. He was an inf infantry soldier who I treated in my first month there. He had just returned from Walter Reed Hospital where he had been evacuated four months earlier. A rocket had torn a hole through his Humvee, killing his commander and ripping the top two layers of his right quadriceps muscle off. They reconstructed it and then somehow he faked his way out of the hospital saying he was good. And they let him return. He walked with a limp. His leg strength was terrible. There was no way that he should have been there. And he very happily told me how he had tricked the doctor into letting him come back. <laughs> Ma'am, my unit needs me, he told me. My jaw just dropped. Who are these men that I treat day in and day out? These men who fight wars who think war, who dream war, who ask to return to war. Their bodies are injured with broken bones and broken flesh, but clearly they are not broken in spirit. Maybe they're simply fearless or, or they just hate fear and so they try to conquer it. I do know they come back for their brothers in arms, their battle buddies. And it must be a bond that is so strong that it overrides the rational fear of dying in this dirty old place where the dust is older than the U.S. Constitution. They trick their doctors stateside and they wind up in my clinic asking me to patch them up so that they can go out and fight with their unit once more. He shouldn't be here, I thought to myself. I asked Specialist Brown, did anyone test if you could run, jump, hop? No, ma'am, he says. I just told him it didn't hurt anymore and I wanted to come back. <sighs> I can't comprehend what drives him, but I do not think it's hate. I am quite sure it is not hate. From what I've seen, this type of soldier is rarely the outwardly macho type. 
They come in all shapes and sizes. They're often quiet, sometimes intense, and always very respectful. They're rarely the hua ones who boast and call attention to themselves. These men just soldier on and on and on. Day after day, I treated them, my soldiers, the same kind of soldiers I'd treated in my stateside clinic, but here I was in their world. Sure, I could work on their necks and knees, and I did with all my power, but they manned the guard towers that kept me safe. They traveled on convoys to protect me in case we were attacked. They came into TMC with blood on their uniforms, telling me they were late for their physical therapy appointment because their convoy had been an IED attack. I watched them work day and night in the harshest place on the planet. For a while, I felt embarrassed that I carried the same title that they did. I felt unworthy of the word soldier. A few jokes here and there that my uniform looked a lot cleaner than my weapon. But by the end of my deployment, it became clear to me that my mission was to take care of them. And they didn't expect or even want me to be like them. But I'm incredibly proud that I tried, even for just a little while. Going home was difficult, leaving my patients, partying with my medical team. It was like leaving my family all over again, even worse in some ways. Like, life that year was reduced down to the most vital, the most essential bits and pieces of being human that I can think of. It seems like to me that that year of my life is in color and everything else is in black and white. I remember it so vividly. I had a front row seat watching the best and the worst of man. Perhaps the true essence of man in the rawest form that it exists, surviving. I don't ever want to be back in a war zone. It was an awful year. But I don't regret it either. And I would do it again. For all the terrible things that happened while I was there, I would still do it again. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy Smith.